We're here today to tell you about a really exciting project happening just down the road in St Albans that is very closely connected to the university, as you'll sort of find out in terms of two of the artists who are participating in the project. Um, so we've got a bit of a line-up of us today. Um, who are we? Um, you know who I am. Um, I'm the curator for the project that we're going to talk about and I work as well with the curator of the Museum um, of St Albans, uh, Catherine Newley. The two of us are joint curators on the project. We have our lead artist for the project, Lyndall, sitting here. We have um, Abby Spendlove, who some of you might know. Abby is currently doing an MA in Fine Art with us at UH. <laughs> And we have um, Katie Gillam Hull at the end, who I think some of you know particularly well from um, the Contemporary Design Craft course. Katie graduated last year from that course. And Lyndall is the lead artist on the project that we're going to talk about. And Abby and um, Katie are the support artists for the project. It's a kind of way of working that very often happens with um, an artist project commission or a residency. So I'm showing you here a picture of um, a building you might recognise. Um, UH Galleries is a partner in a really exciting project with St Albans City and District Council, which is the redevelopment of the existing town hall right in the centre of St Albans, um, converting it into a new museum and art gallery for the city. Hands up anyone who knows the building or knows about the project already? Brilliant, some of you, that's great. Um, so the vision for this building um, hello, is to create something a little bit like this um, architect's um, kind of uh, impression of it. Um, it will open, we hope, late in 2017. These things do always have a way of slipping time-wise, big, build, big building projects like this, but it is still scheduled to open um, in 2017. It's costing... Um, nearly 7.75 million pounds to convert the building. Um, a big chunk of this is Heritage Lottery Fund funding, which we have recently secured, which um, we're really, really pleased about. And the rest is being raised by St Albans City, City and District Council. And there's a kind of avid fundraising um, scheme going on at the moment to raise the rest of the money. Just to give you a little bit of an idea of the building, if you don't know it, to take you for a little bit of a walk through it, um, for some of the key um, aspects of it. Um, at the centre of the building, at the moment, there's a Grade 2 listed courtroom, one of uh, the few remaining pre-Victorian uh, courtrooms in the country. There's um, a, a photo um, of it here. Um, this, I mean, the, the building to date has been used in a bit of a piecemeal way. Um, so there's the courtroom, which sometimes you will turn up on a Saturday afternoon and find a book sale happening in the courtroom. There are some as education workshops in the courtroom. Um, then there's through another door. Um, up until recently, you would have entered the building and gone into the Merchant Tea House. Um, and you could have gone in through another door and made your way upstairs and possibly had some kind of event or gone to an exhibition in the assembly rooms upstairs. And if you'd gone in through another entrance around the side, you'd have gone into the building and found the Tourist Information Centre. So what we have is a very centrally placed building with this slight confused usage and not a sense of a whole building kind of working as one. And what this new um, project is allowing is to kind of pull the, the building back as one functioning public space, um, using all the spaces um, kind of it, very flexibly, um, but kind of giving them more kind of public use and access and, and more of, more of a, a function and really being essential to the life of the town of, um, and city of St Albans. So just to give you an idea of the other space, this is a signature space, the um, assembly room, which has been um, used very much to generate income to this point with um, hiring out for weddings and other um, activities. And we've got visions of using this very much um, as a space to commission new work, um, slightly like the, the turbine hall idea. Um, it will also be used for um, events as well to bring in some income, because obviously there's a business plan that needs to kind of keep the whole thing going. Um, but this... Um, so another of the key key spaces. Elsewhere, we've got kind of rather beautiful bits uh, of in, in the circulation spaces, um, which will be um, kind of utilised. And then there's a small um, image here of the Merchant Tea House, which is um, no longer um, there. Underground, we're going to have a white cube space. So there's the plan to dig out underneath the building. Part of the building um, does 
has a, have a, an underground part, which is where the cells are. There are a number of cells in the original courtroom. Um, Perfect place for artists. Very good place for artists, yes. A couple of artist studios down there. Um, and we're going to be digging this out and creating a kind of classic kind of white cube space underground. Um, and that will be enable us to show all sorts of different um, kind of high, more high, maybe higher quality, higher value artwork because there'll be environmental conditions in this part of the building. Um, other um, kind of aspect that's really key is this building has very much got to function as a social building. It's going to function as a museum and art gallery, but generating social capital and um, it being very much a place that people want to hang out and spend more than kind of 10 minutes and have a quick coffee and leave is something we're really interested in, how we get people to come to this building and stay, to tweet there, to hang out there, to engage with things, to, to explore it, to meet people. We're really looking at how to create a, a social, real social sense around this building without compromising the art and the exhibits and things and the sort of specialist nature of what we want to do. We're really keen that we get that sense of the social very much at the heart of the building. So it's very much a period of transition and flux at the moment. Um, we closed the um, original museum of St Albans on the Hatfield Road site um, at the end of um, September, um, just gone. And we've now moved into what we've been calling an interim period, a two year interim period, um, where we don't have a venue. Anticipating opening the new museum and um, gallery um, in late 2017. I'm just showing you a couple of slides here just to remind you of what the old museum and art gallery looked like on the Hatfield Road, a Victorian kind of classic, Victorian kind of quite small museum. And then one of the, um, the permanent, um, the, that was actually a, a temporary exhibition space within the museum. What's going to happen to that space then? That is being sold off and it's going to be redeveloped for housing. And the proceeds of selling that site, the council are actually developing that themselves and that money will then go into the, the new building. So. Um, so the challenge really um, for the team, that's um, myself and some colleagues here and also the team at the museum, um, is how, how do we keep our existing audience kind of engaged with the collections and engaged with the project and how do we grow new audiences at, at a period of time when we have no venue? And how do we continue to make the collections visible, accessible and alive um, for St Albans residents and visitors during this period? How do we do that? Well, one of our solutions is artists and um, one of the uh, ways that this is being approached is by engaging artists in the process um, that we're going through. So Lyndall um, has been commissioned to make, make a, a piece of work, really it's one piece of work, that's going to span across uh, the three stages of this project. And we're wanting um, Lyndall to take us very much, all of us on a journey, the museum staff, the volunteers, existing um, visitors that we've got a relationship with, and the new visitors that we hope, the new people we hope to kind of to pick up along the way. And we want her to take us on a journey through um, leaving one building into a period, a period of flux with no kind of home and into this new, amazing new building. Um, and Lyndall is part way through this project and today is about her telling us a little bit about what she's done to this point and a bit of a hint of what she's going to do next. So. The project for Lyndall was about celebrating the old museum and kind of marking it, marking the exit of that museum with a new piece of work. And then about over this two year period of, of, of closure, Lyndall looking at ways to develop a project that could engage, continue to engage people with the collections and the development project um, while we were waiting for the new building to be built. And then the third stage of her project is about creating a legacy artwork, as we're calling it, a legacy artwork to be created especially for the new museum. So there's a sense of the old museum, the things that are happening in this interim phase, all come with us and go into the new building from when we open the new building. A little bit of boring background to this is we were, uh, uh, kind of boring but important, we were awarded um, a funding um, award of th uh, £36,000 for Lindell's project, it sounds a huge amount of money but as soon as you start putting that, drilling that down into kind of time to do things and um, it's amazing how quickly it disappears. Um, and we were awarded that from the Arts Council and I've done a lovely little picture here of the funding application on the carpet this morning just to show you that 
the kind of um, effort that one does need to go to kind of pull in this kind of money in the partnership with Lindell, with the museum team, with the audience development team, at the, and, and how, how many hoops you really have to, to jump through and how much you need to have thought through a project, particularly in how you're going to engage with people and make it really a publicly accessible and participatory project. So we did spend two or three pretty much solid weeks preparing this application with all the budget, all the information to then pull down um, this, this award. So where are we now at this moment? Where are you finding us now today? Um, the museum, as I said, the old museum is closed and it was closed with a spectacular installation that um, uh, Lindell created um, in the, the weeks leading up to its closure. And Lindell's going to tell us more about that in a moment. Um, she transformed an original and sort of 1980s museum display, quite a conventional, typical 1980s museum display into a new sculptural installation. And we're now a little bit, a few months into this two year um, interim period. Um, and Lindell is working on her ideas now for how to deliver this part of the project. And this is where um, Katie and Abby come into the project um, in a sort of supporting artistic role, but um, to kind of extend the reach and impact of um, some of Lindell's ideas um, and by creating their own responses and their own artwork in response to the collection. And each of them will engage with their own community or group of people um, with their projects. So it's about a, an opportunity for two other artists to come along and kind of extend and expand on what the lead artist is doing. And Lindell has considerable experience in engaging with collections, engaging with sites, historic sites. She has very much a sort of research-based practice and she's a lot, got a lot to offer artists that may be like, earlier in their career. Um, so the idea is there's a kind of mentoring relationship here that we've, um, we're going to be developing where Lindell kind of supports and helps Abby and Katie as they grow and develop their own ideas. And we hope at the end of it we're equipping Abby, um, who's in part of it through her um, first year of her MA, Katie, who's a recent graduate, we hope at the end um, of the project they will have a fantastic new piece of work, experience of engaging and thinking about an audience for their work. They'll have benefited from Lindell's experience. They will have some strong images professionally taken of their, their piece of work. And hopefully they can go from this project to then be the lead artist on their own projects. So it's that kind of commitment to artist development. It's not far away for most of you guys that it might be the way, the way you kind of leave here or and it might be your first step. And we look very favorably um, on people graduating here and some of you may know, but the art collection at the university actually purchased the graduation, um, the piece of work that uh, Katie made in her for a graduation um, exhibition. So um, there's a real commitment to um, you guys looking for opportunities where UH galleries can really help give you the next step um, into your careers as, as artists or uh, creative people. Um, it's now going to be, uh, it's now the time I'm going to hand over to the artists. Um, Lindell's going to talk, we think, for about 20 minutes, pr primarily about the project that she did um, in September with a slight hint to what's coming next. And then um, we'll follow that with um, a, a short presentation of where Abby and Katie are in their projects. They're very early stages. There's been a bit of exploratory um, work done visiting the museum store, getting some ideas, but we're, we're at a very early stage. And what I'd like to propose is we come back maybe in another 12 months and kind of tell you where we've got to and how all these projects are developing. Okay. Yeah. okay. Oh, I've even got a... Ooh. Are you all right? Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Um, as Annabelle mentioned, um, my task was to, to come in and, the first phase anyway, to, to look at the museum that no longer exists and to make a work in response to what I discovered that would be there when the museum closed. And I think the really clever thing curatorially from Annabelle and Kat's point of view was to, to see the, the venue closed in a form of celebration rather than closing empty. Because it could have been a very easy solution to say, well, we just pack up the collection or, you know, I think there were two ways of doing it. They could have shut the, the doors of the museum and then packed up the collection after that. Or they could have packed up the collection gradually and then shut the doors. So you would have kind of had a dying venue in a sense. But um, 
it was decided that when I came on board that as I kind of referred to it as like a you know the tide moving in and out as the collection was receding I was kind of taking over in the spaces it wasn't quite as seamless as that <laughs> but um yeah, but it worked conceptually <laughs> more than it did in the yes but the but that that was kind of the aim behind it so I'm just curious hands up if any of you saw or know the permanent display that was on the top floor of the museum yeah a couple of people which is great well I do have some pictures because I think it's important sure. that you kind of see what the space was it was as Annabelle mentioned it was um, a or late 1980s display absolutely cutting edge and fashionable of the time but not so much now it was um, I think a space that quite you could quite happily say hadn't been maybe loved to look after it for a long period of time. It was, there was definitely a huge amount of dirt, I know that. Um, and it, it was that classic kind of overly full, um, it places completely impenetrable because there was so much information. It was, it was pretty much an assault of the senses. So I remember the first time that Annabelle and I walked through it, she just looked panicked and said, you can't, there's nothing you can do with this space. <laughs> um, so this, this just gives you a flavour. Um, and it wasn't as though that there was one style that was followed through. It was just a mishmash of different murals, different styles, different ways of displaying things. That um, it was just very hard to focus on individual objects. This was classic. This looked like a bad junk shop with lots of bits and pieces of furniture in, in one section. So in terms of... I knew I wanted to come up with an installation, for want of a better word, that had a, a theme to it that connected specifically to St Albans because I thought that was important. And I wanted to work with objects and parts of the collection that were very rarely seen. So I chose very much to look at the archives because generally archives are kept in boxes, in rooms and never really see the light of day very occasionally a few pieces of paper from the archive might be put in a display case but essentially they're things that are usually hidden away and the off-site store as you know everyone sitting out here can vouch for is a treasure trove of all sorts of things which again are in the off-site store you very rarely see them so very early on Kat mentioned that there was a book called Made in St Albans which was a series of um, walking tours around St Albans that looked at the various buildings that related to the industries that were in St Albans roughly from the 1870s to the 1970s. And history is something that I'm, I'm really interested in. Excuse me, my throat's going a bit croaky. Um, so I, I, I chose basically eight industries that, again, were in that time frame, 1870 to 1970, that there was enough material in the archive on. I mean, I know there are certain industries that are, you know, were quite big in St Albans but there was nothing in the archive so it was very important to focus on what was in the archive and also to, to pick up on some industries industries that people didn't know were in St Albans and this is a very good example which was H Rose and Sons brush manufacturers which were one of the earliest industries and even people who've lived in St Albans for a long time were very surprised um, to hear about that this organisation actually existed and one of the things that in terms of transforming the gallery, I was always really keen that my research, any physical work that was done in the space actually happened when the museum was open. So that myself and the fantastic team of volunteers that I had working with me were in the space. So we could have conversations with people and so they knew what I was doing. So it was, you know, I ended up having some really fantastic conversations and so did the people who worked with me with locals about these industries. So moving forward, um, what I'll show you is some historical photographs of material from the archive, but also the installation itself. And I kind of saw the work as a oversized sculpture, for want of a better description. And I think, again, Kat still looks in amazement at my comment that I wanted to paint the whole entire space, because it's quite a huge space. So every surface was painted essentially white and it wasn't white to turn it into a gallery space I didn't want that but it was such a dark space with very little natural light in there that by using the white it would actually bounce light a lot around a lot more 
gold was the second most important colour and, and that very much came about because I guess it's symbolic of richness and kind of the, the, the hidden wealth of material that's in the archive, that's something that is very rich, it's very kind of, you know, it, it's very strong in its visual appearance. And one day when visitors were coming through, there was one lady who saw a section of gold painted on the wall and she got really, really excited. And what was fantastic is that she said, I love the use of gold because it hints at the riches, riches that are in museums. So, it, it, you know, I love the fact that the people visiting got it. And then subsequently I used a, a number of metallic colours because I got a bit into metallic colours. So um, this is the brush section and the exhibition or the, the oversized sculpture had works from the archive or objects from the archive and off-site store. There was the actual painted structure that I'd created, but there was also my own works in response to the material that I was researching. So in the brush section, we have, in this case here, there's a fantastic tool collection in the um, museum collection called the Salmon Collection, and these were tools that related to the making of brushes, so and it was important to include those. And then in terms of the artwork, and uh, oops, the artworks varied very much according to each section. I discovered that there is an existing company in, I forget the name of the place now, how embarrassing, not that far from St Albans, that still makes handmade brushes and that have been making them since the 1800s and visiting them was a, a pure joy. And I, I started buying bits of their bits, for want of a better description, and they made these beautiful individual sections of bristle. So I, I bought lots of those, and then I just had a, a piece where people could physically touch the brushes, because I don't know anybody else. When you see those things, you always want to touch them, and I, I wanted things that people could actually interact with physically. And then various images that came from the early catalogues I had printed on acrylic, clear acrylic, to act as little postcards. The next um, company was Heath and Heather that were herb specialists and at one point this warehouse was the largest herbal warehouse in the world which is kind of quite extraordinary. And w another thing that I found fascinating is all of these major industries that were putting out a huge volume of material and today there's pretty much nothing left. And you know, in itself, that sense of loss is quite fascinating. So for Heath and Heather, um, this is just a detail of one of the works. This um, case had a lot of taxidermy specimens in it um, that were on these branches. So Katie, bless her, <laughs> painted the branches gold. Um, and then within the collection, there were these very beautiful little glass cloches that came from a company called Dixon's who were again a, a seed company and I'm assuming they were used to put on the seedlings when they were growing. So I, I chose, I got um, heath flowers and lavender flowers and then inserted those into, inside the, the cloches. Um, there was also, thanks to Abby, <laughs> it was fantastic, it was the first time I'd actually had a lot of co-helpers in making work so it was a real Anina was with us as well. yes and Anina was one of the fantastic group of people that helped so for me it was I thought it was actually going to be really strange but actually it was really easy <laughs> and you know this is the first work that has been made that I didn't even have a hand in really in terms of physically threading anything so it's quite liberating I should do more of it <laughs> well, it's worth saying actually because Linda normally you're very controlled about <laughs> She makes everything herself as very high, very high standards. It's meticulously crafted, and really nobody would, you know, be invited to kind of come in and mess with it. But this, because it was such a huge space that needed to be kind of taken over, you had to let I go to, and yeah. sublet, and and there was a lightness of touch at times to kind of fill fill that space in a way mm. quite kind of quickly and easily. So it was quite an interesting yeah. experience for you to have to let go. And kind of so I mean, I should probably mention, which I haven't, is that. The whole entire project, including my research and the fabrication and the realization, all took place in ten weeks. And and that's you know that I've never done that in my life before. <laughs> um, near kill me, but we did it. So anyway, there was a beautiful installation of suspended rose petals again, <coughs> linking back to herbs and the fact that that rose petals were very commonly used. 
Um, the next company, I mean, I'm not showing you all the works or else we'll be here all day. Next company was Mercer's that made pre precision measuring equipment. They started off making, um, oh, forget the name of them, clocks for ships, anyway. And um, so this was one of the areas, I guess, there was light touch where I didn't really kind of make works as such. It was more about, I guess, the design of the actual spaces. And the, the, I suppose the key sort of made work was this wall here where um, within the catalogues of Mercer, there was always lots of mathematical numbers relating to the precision detailedness of the instruments. And there was just columns and columns of numbers. And I've always been a bit sort of fixated on columns of numbers. So I had these printed as vinyl text on the wall in gold text. <coughs> so again, I, I guess this is a good example where within the actual traditional cases, there was actually objects from the collection. And then my works and the scheme sat but they around were all that. objects selected by, by you, me, so all yeah. the original display had left, and it was being it was the role as curator, yes. of exhibition designer, of making your own pieces. It was a kind of really extended role of an artist, kind of within the space. And it was it's probably the first time I've curated such, you know, a big show from museum objects. And this gives you a glimpse through from that wall into the Rider Seeds area, which were seed merchants, and. I kind of, kind of need to point out Samuel Ryder, besides being a seed merchant, he was one of the first people to come up with the small packets of seeds that you bought, which are now very, very common. Um, he was also very influential in golf, which is important to mention. If anyone knows the Ryder Cup, which is the, the golf between America and the um, Europe, it was him that came up with the cup and sort of founded that. So the, the, the weird combination of golf and horticulture played a an important part of the works for this area. So on the left here, there was a suspended, suspended installation of gold-painted golf balls, of which Katie painted quite a few, um, with dried Nigella Love in the Mist seed pods. That's just a detail. I mean, it was interesting for me, because like, you kind of, obviously, I was working within the space, and I could also kind of see the potential for some of these pieces to be on a massive scale in a different space. I mean, I think this work in a, a white cube space on a vast volume would be quite extraordinary. Um, but there may be the potential for that in the future. Um, it's another sort of favourite little work of mine. Within one of the catalogues, there was um, a page of gladioli uh, species that they were selling and all the names of the species were named after birds. Um, so I basically went over about a three day period and bought every kind of bird I could in little ceramic form from car boot sales, junk shops, whatever, and um, <coughs> painted the actual base of the bird's gold. And the description that goes with them is actually the description of the gladioli flower that came from the catalogue. And then in the niche there was actually a fresh gladioli to go with them. Um, again, just sort of more an overview shot. Uh, this section, uh, before I transformed the space, was actually the, the Samuel Ryder section. And there's a where Cafe Rouge is in St Albans was Ryder's Seed Hall, and it's where he showed all the plants that they sold, or a selection of the plants that they sold. So I was very keen to have flowers on show um, and I use the actual vases that they use in Royal Horticultural shows to give that sense of them being a show flower. And then the installation was a suspended installation <coughs> of metallic painted golf tees with gold painted broad bean seeds. <laughs> Again, another piece on a large scale, even larger scale, would be quite impressive. Nicholson and Co. coat specialists. And um, these beautiful sections of posters um, were such a strong visual that I wanted them in the show. As well as, there was an awful lot of artwork in the archive that were um, sort of lead up drawings to advertisements, which were incredibly beautiful. And this particular um, case before I arrived had a, a washerwoman in Victorian out costume, as well as a whole lot of things to do with washing. And what was particularly interesting is they, they had the, 
uh, mannequin actually facing the back wall, so you saw the back of her. And within the archive of drawings, there was a whole lot of men just with their back and looking forward. So again, little things like that, I was very consciously, consciously making links with what was there before and what's kind and of there so now. With so many regular visitors to it, they, a lot of people would have picked up yeah, those things. on those visual connections. Um, and then within the archive, um, with the coats, there were these very beautiful little drawings of kind of sections of the body and clothing with kind of letters and numbers, obviously, all for measuring. So these were just large drawings that I painted and then stitched into with gold thread. Um, then Belito hosiery manufacturers, which were the really kind of fun part. People love Belito. <laughs> And they're also quite recent memory. I think they, they closed in the late 60s, 70s, so a lot of people kind of remember Bolito. And um, within the collection, there was an actual wooden stocking board that they used to kind of test the stockings on before they were you know, put into their packets. So I had three of those made. And this list of names were, I went through every item um, in the Belito box and wrote down every name of every colour that I saw. So this was just a list of the colours of the various stockings. Can you read any of them? Yeah. Um, uh, Mist Haze, Sun Glamour, Sun Star, Sun Time, Coral Blush, Rose Blush, Lilac, Ice Blue. They were very beautiful names and quite, kind of quite of the period, I guess, of the 60s and 70s. With the stockings, well actually here you can see that there's a, a kind of a large, which, which is actually a scrapbook. Belito had an interesting history in that during the war they went from making stockings to making munitions and they employed a photographer to document the factory before and during the war so they had a record of the role <coughs> of the factory in wartime. And this scrapbook has the original photographs that the photographer took and there's some very beautiful kind of before and after like shots. So there's Miss Sims in one photograph doing, putting all the stockings in their boxes and in the racks. And then there's Miss Sims making munitions with her you know, hair tied up in the scarf. So it's, and there's a lot of photographs like that in the book. So the stocking boards that I had made were coloured the same, we used the metallic colours that were in the, 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 scheme, the colour scheme. And then I had a, an, a stamp made that was basically the, the shape of the munition shell that they made on site. And then embossed on top of that was a, a floral pattern that came from one of their gift bags. And then that was printed on gold on each of the stockings. And that's just a fantastic example of design. <laughs> um, the, the, packets of sto the stocking packets are just very beautiful. And again, things very much of their time. And then lastly, um, there's a, a huge amount of printing in St Albans. And one of the main companies was Eversheds. And what I particularly liked about Eversheds was their printing of things that were connected to trade. Um, they did lots of packaging for, um, for dripping or for butter. Um, they had a huge business in doing initially the cardboard bottle tops for milk and they then graduated to doing the foil bottle tops for milk <coughs> in the kind of late 40s early 50s where they obviously put a huge amount of money into buying all the equipment and they took their trade stall to various um, trade stalls around the country Olympia and those kinds of places so I was quite keen to work with milk bottle tops um, so there was two installations in each of these kind of display areas that had just suspended little bottle tops in them. So that's, that's the first phase. So in terms of the second phase, I've, I'm read, I was really keen to look back at the origins of the first museum, which was established in the late 1800s. It came about really by a group of, well, I guess they were a mix between entrepreneurial, um, well-to-do, um, with an interest in creating better educational opportunities for the people in St Albans. So this group of essentially men 
got together and decided that they'd like to create a museum for, at that point it was broader Hertfordshire and not St Albans focused. So they set about, they had a few initial showings of objects and then they decided they wanted a purpose built museum so they raised the funds for the building that Annabelle showed you at the beginning and that museum was opened in 1898. And when they started obviously there was no collection and the collection actually, the first collection came about by loans and donations from these individuals. And there is a fantastic record, you know, just a list of donations and loans where they have the name of the person, the street they lived in, which is essentially, I'd say 95% of them all lived in St Albans, and then the list of what they donated. So the second phase for me is to, to do more research on what that was. I have the list of things. I've started looking at what those things are by doing web searches. The next step for me is to try and find out how many of those original loans and donations still exist in the collection. So what I'd like to do is to create some kind of pop-up mobile museum that's actually a reflection of that first ever museum collection. But it will be shown in slightly unusual ways. I think that's kind of the best thing I can dis say at this moment um, in that I'll either have some kind of unit or units prefabricated that are movable, that can take the collection and show it at the railway station, in the shopping centre, in a park, um, or it may be things like old china cabinets that are adapted that do the same thing, I don't know yet. Um, so stay tuned really, if we, if we have another get together in a year's time then um, we might know what I've chosen. <laughs> so that's it for me, thank you. So I'll hand over to Abby. <laughs> Great, okay, thanks Linda. Um, so as Annabelle explained at the start, um, mine and Katie's role on this project are as support artists. Um, and so we're both at kind of different early stages of our careers and also at a very early stage within this project. So really today I just want to kind of introduce you to me and my practice a bit and then talk to you about how I'm approaching this commission um, and the sort of things that I've been uncovering so far. Um, so as, as Annabelle said, I'm currently studying for the MA at the University of Hertfordshire. Um, I did my undergraduate in fine art at Central St Martins. I graduated in um, 2008 and uh, when I was studying I specialised in sculpture um, and uh, sculpture is a really interesting kind of field to explore because it's so broad and diverse and um, I think it kind of opened lots of different working practices to me but also um, gave me this kind of freedom to really work um, with anything um, in terms of materials and so <coughs> I became quite drawn to um, working with materials that didn't hang around for very long so I was experimenting with things like ice um, and firework smoke and, uh, and using video and photography as a way to kind of record these um, happenings and, and uh, sort of small installations um, and that kind of interest in in sort of working with materials that are kind of transient in some ways so is a thread which is sort of stayed through with my with my practice sort of to the current time. Um, so these are just some sort of brief images of past pieces of work which span sort of photography, drawing um, and installation. And the way that I first got to know Annabelle and Lindor was through um, the Eastern Approaches exhibition in, um, at the University of Hertfordshire that, they, that the University of Hertfordshire organised in St Albans every year. It's an open um, sort of salon style show um, that you can put work in for. If you've not submitted anything before, I recommend that you have a look at it. Um, and I submitted uh, this piece of work, which is... Um, uh, a, a text piece and it, an embroidery of a, a sampler of the alphabet 
um, which I've exhibited um, back to front and actually uh, sort of won a prize for that piece of work when it was part of the exhibition and that was how I sort of first connected with Annabelle and Lyndall who were on the judging panel for that project. Um, and I've been working a bit more with, with kind of sewn text and things more recently. So that's a little bit about my work um, and my approach to this project really. Um, I've sort of been really open-minded with it because the resource is so rich that I kind of feel like something is going to come from it. You know, there's, there's so much within the off-site store that really my approach has been to just kind of start to explore it really in the hope that lightning's going to strike and I'm going to find some kind of gem or something that I want to get my teeth stuck into. Um, and there's a few different areas that are interesting me at the moment um, and I'm not entirely sure kind of which direction that I'll go down with the commission but um, just thought I would briefly introduce you to the kind of my thoughts and where they're at at the moment. Um, and so these are some images of the inside of the off-site store. So it's sort of arranged in lots of different shelving units which you can move along and then objects are mostly boxed up, larger items are kind of freestanding on shelves or in other storage spaces and then there's chests of maps and drawings and things. Um, but I was particularly interested in these boxes and particularly interested in the labelling of the boxes so as you go around most of the boxes are labelled with what's inside them um, and they're arranged within the store in a specific way. Um, but some words really sort of jump out, fossilised footprint. Um, and so as I, when I first visited the store, we didn't actually open any of the boxes. We just uh, were introduced to the collection sort of as it is housed in storage. Um, and I started to make notes of lots of these different labels um, <coughs> and things like this sharpening stone, no context. Um, and I, I found that I was quite drawn to these objects which... Um, <coughs> kind of don't have a complete story to them or perhaps um, there's something intriguing about them that um, things like this like no context or they might, I might have kind of picked out an item and then the curator would say well actually we don't really know what that is we don't really know where that's come from or you know there seemed to be a bit of a kind of gap in the knowledge and I find that exciting you know that there are there are some objects which kind of um, are kind of refusing to be boxed up or, or kind of labelled specifically. Um, and so I've been playing around with some of these, these words and uh, the thing I like about creating this kind of sort of taxonomy or, or list of objects is the, the kind of chance poetry that can happen when, when the words are connected with each other. So things like glass room cesspit, buckles, school bell, bellows, um, and these, these connections that come out are, are quite fun and interesting but the, you know they just happen by chance um, but also how I'm interested in that the the words or the, the kind of simple description of an object um, really evokes lots um, of ideas within our imagination and maybe sort of playing on that a bit. Um, I'm also interested in um, glass as a material so I wanted to have a look at some of the glass in the connect collection and the reason I was interested in Glass is because um, because of its its sort of materiality. Um, it can interact with light. So, unlike some materials which are kind of petrified or you know sort of monumental in some way that they are are fixed in a fixed state, glass has this kind of potential to kind of change in, in the way that light can interact with it. So I quite like that you know as an object there's some kind of potential for a new interaction or something different to happen. Um, and so when I started looking through some of the fragments of glass, they're packaged up very tightly. So some, some pieces of glass um, have come from sort of archaeological digs or excavations and um, when they collect items of interest then they're packaged up in a specific way and given to the collection for storage and catalogued. Um, and uh, some of these items, so this was in a box called Medieval Glass and when I unpackaged this sort of tiny little package with two sort of packages of glass inside um, it, it kind of deteriorated so much that, um, oh which way am I going? Sorry. 
that uh, it's almost kind of crumbling and uh, and sort of sticking to the tissue um, and so and even you can see in these ones how in the corner of these objects the, the glass has really started to kind of break down completely and um, so I'm kind of interested in that and sort of where is the object or where is the item that we're sort of holding on to and and the whole kind of process of cataloguing and storing and and um, the sort of journey that these different materials can go on in storage really and as I was looking through this box um, I started just kind of looking at the floor around me and thinking oh look there's just some bits of broken plastic and did I put those there or you know and, and is that an object is that something valuable um, like that could be a piece of crushed Roman pottery or it could just be something that came in off my shoe um, and then there were some small fragments on the floor as well like this piece which looks like perhaps it could be a piece of medieval glass or um, maybe not so uh, yeah there's something that's kind of interesting me about the the kind of journey that objects go on and, and the kind of human interaction with that process um, and then finally the other area that I'm kind of interested in at the moment is a particular object which is this stained glass fragment um, which is a stained glass fragment which was taken from the Abbey probably around the 1700s but um, we know very little about it and what it is if you can see from this photograph is a kind of leaded framework with um, writing inside so the glass is painted and there's a piece of text but um, at some stage during its life it's been severely damaged and lots of the words have been lost um, and I was really drawn to this object because it feels like it's sort of trying to tell a story but that, that the story has kind of been interrupted um, and so I was interested in trying to kind of uncover a bit more about what that story might be, maybe fill in some of the gaps. Um, inside the box there are two pieces of paper, this one, um, which is a note that was taken at the time of the... Um, sort of gifting to the collection, we think, which is from Mr. Bond. It looks like he's sort of donated three different items. Um, and then there was also this piece of paper, which someone has tried to kind of write down what they think the writing on the piece of stained glass is. But actually, having looked at it with the, with the curator the other day, it seems that there's mistakes even on, on this kind of interpretation of the, the sort of missing sentence. And on the other side of that piece of paper was a lovely note to the collection from a lady called Phyllis and, uh, and some numbers. And these um, numbers are um, accessioning numbers and it says it might, it might be associated with these accession numbers. And when we went to look up these numbers, they were linked to um, a piece of tapestry. So there seems to be this kind of disconnect in the in the story that we're trying to uncover around this object so the numbers don't really seem to line up and then when I um, was talking to the curator about the um, accessioning process that has happened um, sort of over the years this these numbers were relating to 1986 which was a time when um, a new kind of system was coming into place so the, the museum has been open since the sort of late 1880s, is that right? Um, and so over the years, there have been a number of different systems that have been in place of how to kind of archive and catalogue the items that are donated um, to the museum. And uh, in the 80s, they brought in this brand new um, Epsom computer where <coughs> a lot of the accessioning numbers were then logged onto this computer system and rumour has it that this computer actually was um, given to a place to be fixed and then that place um, became bankrupt and the computer was taken away by the bailiffs so the computer no longer exists um, but some of the printouts do exist and potentially my item is, is sort of somewhere in these, these um, lists. So I think it's, a, a, again, you know, thinking about objects, I just played around with this image of this old... 80s Epsom computer, the idea that this object could be responsible for kind of writing history in some way um, was quite appealing. 
And I've also played around with this letter, just taking out um, all of the kind of significant words as well. Um, so, yeah, so this is an item which is kind of capturing my imagination at the moment. And this is the accession number which is painted onto it. And in the printouts from the Epson computer that we managed to salve, salvage, um, it kind of sits in between two of the numbers there, and it's the, the number which is on the object is missing from the printout. So there's definitely something to explore there with that, with that panel. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what I've been drawn to so far in the collection. Um, and yeah, maybe in a year's time I can talk to you about where I went with it. Thank you. Great, so Abby kind of introduced where we're coming to this project. Uh, I just thought I'd let you guys know if you don't already, um, one of my most recent projects, as I think it's quite related to the way I think I'm going to approach this one. So this is my degree piece, um, where I collected items such as this one and this one um, from a beach in Norway. I picked them up and I didn't know why they were there, and I fell in love with them because they were these mysterious little broken things. And I started to fix them. Um, so I reimagined what this bottle top would belong to and made it a new object and made it a new body. And that started to develop into jewellery as well. So the jewellery piece would fix the found object and vice versa, that together they would become this whole. And that gives you an idea of my kind of perspective when it comes to approaching found objects, this sort of um, caring attention. I quite like, um, I'm quite drawn to these curious little things. And so when I was offered the chance to work with this archive, uh, when I met Lyndall through her work on the Abundance um, project at the end of the exhibition, um, they mentioned this collection of tools, of 3,000 tools, actually, um, collected by a gentleman called um, Raphael Salomon. And I fell in love with the idea. I just thought, who collected 3,000 tools? Why did they do it? What are these 3,000 tools? And I got a chance to have a look at them and learn about this man. Um, as an engineer for MS, he just travelled everywhere across the country and on his days off would just end up buying tools from craftsmen. And after going into the archives and learning a bit more about him, I realised that he just loved talking to craftspeople when he was a kid. I mean, he knew all of the local craftspeople in his area and he found it fascinating. And these trades were dying out. They didn't need their tools anymore or they didn't have the business and so he just started buying them up. I don't know whether it was a way to support them or to collect them, but he just started doing this and it, it continued and then it came to about 3,000 tools. Um, and yeah, that collection started in 1946. But then by 1989, he'd, this collection was quite vast and he'd sold a large amount of it to the Museum of St Albans and it was arranged in this exhibition. There's actually an image from the exhibition which he was heavily involved in the curation of. Um, and I think I maybe have another couple of images. Yeah, so this is the state it is in, in, at the moment in the archive. This is when I came to it. And this does not do it justice. 3,000 tools somewhat takes over the archive, um, several rooms of it. Um, and so there's kind of too much to see. But what I was really interested in was how he's documented them. He has made two different kinds of recording system and noting system like two different numbered systems that work together. He's got the logbooks of every craftsperson he bought them from. He's got photographs of those craftspeople. He has then written about them. He's collected the industry catalogues, the amount of work he's put into collating all of this. Um, the more I think about it, it's slightly familiar to the way I wanted to protect these little objects I found. Um, and I was just really drawn to the history and the story behind each one of these that was used by a craftsperson. But what also drew me to them was that quite mysterious? I mean, looking at this box of tools, I could read the label that was quite confusing as well. I don't know what you mean, Abby. But I have no idea what they're used for. I don't know how they're used. Um, they look to me quite sad, um, very mysterious. I have no idea what to do with them. Um, but they look quite cold. Um, I want them to sort of come alive again, not just because the material itself is aged and decayed. And then I started coming across his photography he'd collected. And this one really drew my attention. So it's the first time I'd seen one of his tools look alive again. 
it looked like it had its purpose brought back to it, just having been used. Um, and that brings me just to my last couple of images where he'd been uh, photographing the craftspeople themselves as they'd used those tools. And again, they were just starting to come alive to me again. The, the tools made more sense in the hands of their, own, on their owners. And just, yeah, a couple more examples. And so this started to spark the idea of, for me of showcasing this kind of mysterious, I think, beauty of these objects on their own. I mean, he described them as graceful and austere in some of his writings. He, he really loves them. And I want to showcase that. But also I want to somehow put them back in the hands of craftspeople and highlight how we don't know what they're used for unless they're in the hands of these people who've got all of this previous knowledge and experience. And to, um, yeah, to showcase that gap between, I think, is filled with this kind of human creativity and uh, knowledge of craftsmanship. So I'm trying to find a way of doing that at the moment. And hopefully in a year I'll be able to tell you about, I don't know, community collaborations, any of the above, working with other craftspeople. But that's where I want to take those tools. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.